Hi, so my name is Vitor. I'm also from Aslab, as Ali. Um, and I'll talk about this identity explosion problem that we have in state-based CRDTs. And this is a joint work with uh, Carlos Baquero, Paul Sergio, and Joan Leitão, which is from Nova. The other two authors are from Aslav. So uh, maybe it's not needed, but I'll motivate uh, why we actually do data replication. And then uh, I'll talk about this problem um, that we have in CRDTs, the identity explosion. Um, and then some how, how we actually build CRDTs. So this may be useful for people that are uh, now hearing about CRDTs for the first time. And then we use these techniques to build a borrow counter that uh, attempts to solve that problem. So why we replicate? Um, because it improves the fault tolerance of our system. We can still reply to our clients even when some of the servers are down. It improves the performance because uh, we can place replicas close to our clients and we just serve the same data from multiple servers at the same time. And we have an increased throughput. But now, since we have more than one copy of the same data, we need to pick um, which kind of consistency model we want between these, these copies. Uh, and we have strong consistency, which is very successful inside the data center, but once we move to wide area networks, our clients will have to wait a lot. So just to have an idea, uh, using Google Cloud, uh, the run trip time between London and Mumbai is close to 700 milliseconds. So this means that um, if we're running something like Paxos, our leader is in London, we need to contact um, a replica in Mumbai because it's a part of our majority that's close to us and the lower bound on consensus is one run trip. Our client will wait at least 700 milliseconds plus everything else we're doing in our stack. The alternative is we just reply right away to our clients and we have eventual consistency. We diverge, we have possible conflicts. So how does that work? Imagine we have three replicas um, they are replicating a set, empty set from the start, B adds an element, X, and now it sends something to C, C now sees X, uh, and now concurrently you have an addition of X and a removal of X. So this is where, so this is what we call a conflict, and here we need to decide um, what will happen to our state. Um, and the possible solutions here is we say X is in the set uh, or X is not in the set. And these are two conflict resolutions that we have in CRDTs. Um, we have another, other data types like registers, counters, flags, maps, um, and two main variants, operation-based and state-based. And in this talk, I'll focus on state-based and we'll talk about counters. So um, let's imagine we have a client and a server. Server has the counter at zero. And the client issues a, an increment to the server and sends this as a message. Now the server takes its state, which is zero, and the increment is to one. Later on, the client does another increment, sends another message. And now the server state is two. So the question is, what if M1 is lost? Um, and here we can see that the final value of the counter will be one, right? Because uh, when the server receives M2, it will actually have the value at zero, so we'll get one. And if M2 is duplicated, we'll get three here. And this is um, actually very hard to solve. Even Cassandra, they have this issue uh, either proper retry mechanism, and they just mark it as, okay, it's resolved, but we won't fix it. <clears throat> um, so you see, like, if it's lost, should the client retry again or try again? And in that case, it doesn't know what the final value of the counter will be. So in this talk, we'll try to solve that. And the first step is to actually keep state on the client. So the client also has the counter state, which starts at zero. We increment it. And now we send a message, not with the operation, but with the state of the counter. And now the server will do this trick, which will do the maximum of what it had before and what it has now. We do this again. 
And now we can make the same questions as before. So what if M1 is lost? So that is fine because um, when we do this here, we'll get here a zero, and we'll do the maximum between zero and two, we'll get two. And we can, okay, so this was, uh, and we can even uh, send M2 again, and that's fine, maximum two of two, we, we always get two. So can I leave and we solve all our problems? So what's the problem here? <clears throat> uh, the problem here is that now if we have t these two clients and they do this, we, we can just do the maximum of the, the two because we'll lose one of the increments, right? And what CRDTs do um, is to have a counter per, per replica. So when client B does an increment, it increments its own entry of the map the same for client A, and now the server just keeps all these entries. And the trick with the max, we also do it. So like client A can still send um, these again and it will do the maximum here and we're fine. We, we still handle like these retry problems. Um, now the problem with this is that this doesn't scale because we have to keep uh, an entry per all the clients in the system and our observation was that we need to do this even if some of these nodes live. Uh, so what we're going to do here is, uh, is to distinguish nodes that are permanent, that are always in the system, from nodes that uh, join and leave. And these transient nodes will borrow the identity of a permanent node to increment a counter. And when they decide to leave, we have a way to do a safe retirement of these nodes and we'll incorporate their increments uh, in the permanent nodes. Okay, so uh, we've seen notation for maps. Sets, so it's similar. And so I'll use these. Uh, okay, so what's this I? This I is replica identifiers. Uh, and in the grow only counter we saw before, we're mapping uh, replica identifiers to, to natural numbers. Here in the, this pair, I'm having a replica identifier and a natural number, and I'll just represent it like that. And if I have a Boolean, I'll just, um, so we go from true to false, and that means like from underline to overline. You can think of it as active to inactive. So. It's like an entry that is active to inactive. And uh, I'll talk about dots, which are unique identifiers. And for now, we'll, um, we're going to use like geometric figures. Um, and the notation I'm using for that is this bold circle. Okay, so this is the same example we've seen. Just in another perspective, we have increments, now they merge, more increments, now they merge. So this has diagram is very useful to understand the evolution of the state uh, in CRDTs. Okay, so, um, uh, so one data type, Edwin set, but a, a very old design, where we are mapping elements to a set, and the set has a dot that is tagged with a boolean, which will say if the dot is active or not. So we add X and we create a unique identifier, this triangle, which is active for now. And if we want to remove, we just mark it as inactive. We do the same thing for another element. We create a new identifier. It's active now, now it's inactive. Uh, so the problem here is that even though we have removed these two elements, we are still remembering them forever. Uh, and another design, without these tombstones is to, um, to map these elements to a set of these dots. And we're going to keep something on the right, which we'll call causal context. Uh, so now when we create, we add an element, uh, we map it to the, um, to the unique identifier, but we put it on the right. So when we want to remove, we can just forget it. And this is because, um, since it's on the right, we know it was on the left and it was removed. And this, uh, I've learned last week, this is called the uh, no-no streak for some time. 
uh, he's here. You want, if you want to ask him about how this works or in more detail. Uh, so now we can just add the same y element and we remove it. And you see that this is, uh, this is great. So we add stuff that happened in our state. We don't care about them anymore. We just drop it. <clears throat> There's no permanent impact. In practice, these dots are not geometric figures, as you might have guessed. They are actually a pair of a replica identifier and a sequence number. And if we have causal dissemination, uh, this causal context can be, which I'll use CC from now on, can be encoded as a vector. And if you don't have, um, there are still possible encodings that you can do. But I'll keep the naive notation, so I'll just keep, sorry. I'll just keep doing this. So another data type, multi-value register. So you see now we have dots mapped to the value of the register. And we have this causal context there. We'll, we'll always have this causal context because it allows us to do this trick where we can forget things. So Replica writes Lisbon. It creates a dot. And a dot is also in the causal context. So when Replica writes another thing in the register, you see, it just forgot about Lisbon. Now it has a new dot mapped to hello, and concurrently you have B writing world. And this is what you get in a multi-value register. If you have concurrent writes in the register, uh, when you merge them, you're going to keep both. And this uh, is problematic because this is not what users are expecting. So so they write something, and when they read, they are expecting to read a single value, not like multiple values. And this is actually not related with the talk, but I'll keep just going because, I don't know. So um, solution, you use a last writer wins. And now when you write, uh, you, you supply a timestamp as a user. So you say, I'm writing Lisbon at 11.02. I'm writing hello at 11.04. Concurrently, B writes with 11.30. And now when you merge, since this timestamp is bigger than that one, you, you win. World wins. And the problem here is that we just lost one of the writes. So A is not happy now. <clears throat> and this assumes, well, it assumes single uh, unique timestamps because like, if hello and world were written with the same timestamp, what should we do here? And also the problem is that since the clocks may not be synchronized, A could not try to write something in the register with, let's say, 11.17, but it can't because, I don't know, world was written in the future, if you want. Uh, and I'll just let you read this. So, so now we know enough to build this borrow counter. And again, the idea is that transient nodes will ask something to permanent nodes. Um, so the identity in the form of a dot. And the transient nodes will increment the counter using these dots. And you can maybe already imagine that since you're using these dots and we have the causal context, we can do this trick where we'll be able to forget that this transient node ever existed. So let, we'll build it from look, small steps and in the end we'll get the final design. So initially you're going to have a dot map to the value of the counter and the causal context. And now we have A, so starts with the counter at zero, and it just increments, OK? So this, this slide just means that this is where we'll keep the value of the counter, sorry, in this n. But now we also need to track who owns which dot. So um, each replica should say, this is the dot I have. This is the dot I can use to increment a counter. So before we had just a single map from dots to naturals, now we're going to map identifiers to this map. So this means that if some replica has an entry, it will have some dots here to use. And in this, in this, this example, um, we have two nodes. A is a permanent node, and three, T is transient. OK, so uh, we're creating a dot, so we can increment. A, a that is permanent, it, it creates a dot for itself. 
And later on, T, T that joined the system will ask, OK, I want to increment a counter. Um, give me a dot. So we can see here, this is the dot of T, which is A2. So now if T wants to increment a value by 17, it just increments that position. And now we have a problem, which is T wants to leave, but we have no way to tell that in the state. Right? So the idea is that we're going to make T make a promise that it will never increment a counter. Uh, and we're going to use that as a way to safely remove T from the um, T from that map. And so transit nodes should mark dots as inactive. And for that, so what changed here is that now we have this boolean here that will say this is the dot active or not. And this is the final design of the borrow counter. So same example, and now you see that the dot is at active. So it's like uh, the underline active. Mm, same example, now it increments. We have this dot active, and now to retire, we simply mark it as inactive. And now when uh, A sees this, it will understand that T wants to leave the system. It doesn't have, all its dots are inactive, so I can just transfer all those increments to me. Um, OK, great. So you can see that in this execution, we had T, it joined the system, it did what it wanted. It's, I don't want to do anything anymore. I'll just leave, and there's no impact in the states. Um, OK, so that's what we covered. We have a design for counters that it still works over these unreliable networks where think and file, and we may need to retry. Uh, we focus on incremental counters, but this works if you want to just decrement. It's a trivial exercise to add that. And what we didn't cover, uh, so this is like some work by Aslab. Um, I'm copying Nono slides. Um, so, okay, there are other CRT variants, Delta state base. This paper uh, shows some problems that we found while implementing them, pure operation base. So this composition is when we have several CRDTs and we want to put them ones inside the others, like put counters inside maps. And these are two papers that show uh, possible problems and potential solutions for that. And I didn't find the name for this part, but so these so scalable eventual consistency counters is a work that uh, tries to solve this exact problem I was describing. Um, Dotted DB uh, uses as a way to synchronize two replicas without using Merkle trees. So you may be interested in looking at that. And this last one is when you have a partition and you want to synchronize two state-based CRDTs efficiently, if you want. OK, and that's it. So the, the last example um, reminds me of acquiring a lease uh, to be able to write to a specific counter. Once you yeah. return the lease, then you can go away. Um, is, is, the, is the binding of that lease to a specific permanent node because that permanent node is the one that is going to execute the merging? Yeah, exactly. Got so it. not only all permanent nodes can merge. So it's like if I created a dot for you, only you can incorporate my increments. So if you wanted to virtualize those nodes, you would have to have some way of transitioning who is operating that merging. As in if you... If you went a step further in saying, we don't know all these permanent nodes and yeah. how long they're going to stay, but we can create a set of virtual leaders. Yeah. That, and then you acquire the, the merge cap capability on that virtual leader. Yeah, that makes sense. you acquire sense. a lease on writing. And you, whoever has the merge capability can merge those, those updates over time. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look forward. So this is just work in progress, so yeah. just presenting. Uh, one of the problems that I think there exists currently in state based CRT is that your state will have will be polluted by all the replicas that ever did something in this state. So this may be a way to start looking at this and try to do stuff, leave the system without having 
a permanent impact forever. I think this naturally leads to aggregation trees. So, so you can compose these in, in, in a long chain oh. and, and over time merge, merge operations. Uh, so these work here, I think they have th that kind of approach where you, have, uh, you propose an hierarchy between nodes and you can do that um, in that way that you're proposing. Yeah. Thank you again so much. Thank you.